Okay, uh, continuing on. Um, no longer debtor to the flesh. Romans eight twelve. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Here it says we are debtors not to the flesh. This is a strange wording from Old English. We read this incorrectly and assume that Paul is saying we are a debtor to something else. As if we are a debtor to walk in the Spirit. But however, but however I've read this in many translations and I cannot see where Paul is saying that we are actually in debt to anything. Amen. If you are a debtor to anything, including the Spirit, you're no longer under grace, but you're working for a wage. Amen. We've been, or excuse me, we've already been told in Romans 4 that this is not the case. Amen. I found a couple of translations that just say, Therefore, brethren, we are no longer debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. This makes more sense to me. Amen. It is not saying that you are a debtor to anything. It is saying that you are actually not a debtor. You no longer are in debt. Amen. You don't owe anything. Christ gave you the gift of righteousness, the gift of himself as the eternal life. Amen. It is a free gift. Amen. He didn't put you in debt and didn't put you under obligation. We are no longer debtors to the flesh. How does the flesh put you in debt? Through law and religion. Amen. But you are no longer in a debt. You are no longer a debtor. The flesh tells you that you are in debt. You made the mess and now you need to clean it up. That's the big one. <laughs> you are going to make messes in life that are bigger than what you can clean up, especially in relationships. Amen. There will be messes that have real consequences for who you can fellowship with and what circles and kind of relationships you're in because that person was important in a certain sphere and now they're offended. You will sense loss and feel terrible, and your conscience will convict you. You will be tempted to try to address the situation when you know that doing so will only make it worse. Amen. This is the flesh trying to make you a debtor to the situation to say, you have to do something to avoid the consequences. Eventually, you just have to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, this is a mess. You are going to be the one to deliver me from it. Not only that, but I'm not obligated to sit and live in guilt about this thing. I just have to let it go, and I'm free to do that in Christ because the blood has cleansed me. Amen. The cross has crossed me out. My history is gone. Amen. God is not looking at that, and therefore, God is not looking at that and Therefore, it doesn't determine my future. Maybe I can't go touch that situation again. Fine, I don't have to let that dictate my future. God, whoops, where did I go here? <laughs> uh, okay, God determines my future, sorry. So the flesh is the realm that makes you a debtor to situations and things to try to make you clean it up or make you feel like you owe something or make you feel like you're trapped in another way. It makes you feel like a debtor. Another way it makes you feel like a debtor is in the area of temptation. There may be certain kinds of sin, besetting sin, that your flesh feels you have no choice but to commit. You feel like you've got to do those things. Actually, 
You are not a debtor to those things. You are not trapped in your years of servitude before you finally get free from that thing. You don't owe it. <laughs> it's important to at least acknowledge that no matter how strongly you feel a temptation, and even if you commit a sin, it does not mean that you are obligated to commit that sin going forward or that your history has a grip on you. Salvation is always today. Amen. The flesh puts you in the past or in the future in your mind. I've always been this way, or I will always be this, this way. But salvation, by faith, today says, I am crucified with Christ. That means my past is buried, and it is not the determination of my future. Amen. Today, I want to enjoy grace. If you have a situation with an addiction you're struggling with, it's important to make sure you develop you develop a vision of what God has said he accomplished in Christ. What God has said he has accomplished in Christ, even if your situation doesn't seem to change. Amen. Your victory will come as you learn to see that Christ is always yours today. And you can only drink today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not here. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. You may have done that thing yesterday, but you are not condemned. Your past is buried. You may do that thing tomorrow, but you are not to fret or be anxious about it. Sufficient for today is the evil thereof. Uh, Matthew 6.34 Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation. Matthew 6, 11. The power of salvation is today and you can only have as much as you will allow. The power of salvation is today and you can only have as much as today will allow you to enjoy. The more you get free from the yesterday and tomorrow thinking and learn to drink of him in the moment, the less you will feel the sense of obligation and debt to sin. Amen. It won't be able to lord it over you through condemnation because your past is buried and you know how to put it under the blood. Amen. It also won't be able to come to you with the force of you've always been like this and you'll always be like this because you are learning to partake of grace only in the present. Amen. You'd be surprised how much of sin's dominion over you is through this kind of deceit that acknowledges only your history and trajectory in the flesh and not God's power in this moment. Amen. The flesh lies to you and tells you that you owe the situation. You owe those people. You owe that religious situation. You should have done this and you should have done that. And if only you had done this, you'd probably, you're probably off course. The Bible says you are no longer a debtor to live according to the flesh. Living according to the flesh is using your own capability to try to help God chart the course of your life. No, we give up our right over ourselves and present ourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. Amen. We say, I've been crucified with Christ. My history is behind me. Yesterday is gone or yesterday is behind me. The mess I made is behind me. I may be living in that mess today, but I but it doesn't determine the outcome for today or for tomorrow. But it doesn't determine the outcome for tomorrow. God determines the outcome. That gives him the chance to come in by resurrection and bring things into your sphere that don't exist today because he 
calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead. Romans 4, 17. Amen. Uh, <laughs> sorry, this is kind of hitting me a little hard. Um, not in sadness, but just thankfulness and uh, tears of joy. Because we're not debtors to anything. And um, it's just a... Uh, it's a comfort, even through tears. So, <sighs> forgive me. Uh, you can be in a situation of death, surrounded by death, yet still believing that God will raise you up and cause you to walk in the newness of life. Amen. He brings you to a whole new situation. When you are not a slave to the flesh, you won't be as tempted to handle things in the flesh. Amen. You learn to not see yourself as a debtor to those things. But through the gospel you know. No, excuse me. Through the gospel you acknowledge that God has set you free. And you know you don't owe what the flesh says you are. No, it says you owe. You can turn to Christ. I don't want to speak too idealistically about this. I have things in my life that are consequences of decisions I made, but they don't have to be negative things to me because I'm because by yielding myself to God, I give him a chance to make it all into a blessing. He weaves it into a new, into a new story. Amen. And that's what resurrection really is. Everything the enemy planned for bad in my life and used for flesh or used my flesh to try to bring me into that situation or that God will turn uh, this situation or that. Let me read that again. That's what resurrection is really is. Everything the enemy planned for bad in my life and used my flesh to try to bring me into this situation or that, God will turn to my good. Amen. That's actually what Romans 8 is going to talk about. As we'll see later in the chapter, you've been given a high priest who dwells in you and makes intercession for you when you don't even know what to try. What to try. He sees the whole situation and prays according to the heart of God. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is, and he prays according to the will of God. This is why all things are working together for good. Everything that passes through your sphere, whether it's your mistakes or consequences of bad decisions, you don't have to feel like you owe those bad decisions anything. You can turn to the Lord as a free gift, he will turn those things into something good. Amen. All you have to do is turn to the Lord. Even if you haven't turned to the Lord, he's still praying for you, working everything for good, and drawing you to him. So you'll eventually turn. He's still working everything into his plan to conform to the image of Christ and glorifying you. That's the real good. If you've got bad things in your life, he could be using those bad things to bring down your flesh, renew your inner man, and get you to trust in him and not in what you see so that you walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. This is so that he can accomplish good in your life. Amen. He knows we have weaknesses. But we are not debtors to those weaknesses. We are not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. We don't have to live in that realm. I don't have to go and figure out how to fix my problems by, by myself or even help God. Amen. All I need to do is run to Jesus and ask him to fix it. 
We need to have a real prayer life where we say, Lord, you are the Lord. You live inside of me. You will give life to my mortal body. You've forgiven my sin. You cleanse me of all unrighteousness. You've crucified me. You've already condemned me, condemned it. It's no, there's no condemnation from you. So I give myself to you. I give this body to you. I present it to you on the altar. I thank you that you can do what you want to do in my life. I'm going to take my hands off. You are the potter. I am the clay. Isaiah 29, 16. Amen. I don't have a right to ask what the potter is making. All I can acknowledge is that I am the clay and I'm in your hands. You learn to live you learn to live with a consciousness that he is in you and he is for you. Amen. You have to see that he is for you for this to work. Recognize that he's justified you and you have peace with him and he loves you and he's for you or for your good. He's working everything together for good. Amen. This is the renewing of the mind. When you see this, you will be able to yield more completely to him and see that he is working everything together for good so that you no longer respond as a debtor to the flesh. Amen.